what the ban announcement means for Legacy, and the 2023 Asia Eternal Weekend results. Next on Eternal Turtles. Shout out to all of our Patreon supporters out there. Thank you to the Dirtle Maniacs. If you want to be a Dirtle Maniac, go to patreon.com slash eternal dirtles and help support the channel. It keeps things going. It keeps things updated. Thanks so much for watching. On with the show. Hello and welcome to Eternal Dirtles. I'm your host, Zach Clark. And with me as always, Phil Blackman. Phil, how's it going, man? Zach, between the Asia Eternal Weekend results and the Europe Eternal Weekend results, do we know anything? Is there anything to be learned to know? I think... I think one of the neat things that like I and we kind of talked about this in the last episode is like what what decks you kind of expect to see in in uh, Europe versus Asia. And I think my my thoughts have always been there's more combo in Asia and there's more lands players in uh, in Europe. And that that sort of translates over the numbers aren't like big differences, but there's like five percent more lands players uh, between the two, and there's a little bit larger swath of combo players, like, you know, non-permanent, like, Storm-style combo. Um, and neither one of those numbers is enough that, like, I would be like, prepare for, you know, lands and, and you know, combo decks, but, you know, they exist and you can bias yourself next to turn weekend based on that, I suppose. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that the results that we learned from this one between Europe, uh, which saw four color do not great, and then Asia, which saw four color do great, and the the variance between them. I, I mean, really, I think the most indicative uh, results that we probably have are like SCG Pit from from like last month. That's yeah. probably like a better source for anything else. But like, I, I think I, I'm of the mind of broad stroking it at this point for. Uh, North American Eternal Weekend, you know, days, you know, days wasteland decks, expect some number stand, of dark ritual Delver. decks, yeah, 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 yeah. I, it's like, yeah, you expect some variety of days wasteland decks and have a plan for, you know, if it's scam or if it's just classic, you know, DRC Merktide decks. But have a plan for days wasteland. Have a plan for fast combo in some capacity, whether that's uh, Urza Saga Ancient Tomb decks. Or Dark Ritual, and then have a plan for any number of up the Beanstalk variations between Beanstalk midrange of like Uro and Triumph and Merktide, or Beanstalk control like I like to play, uh, and you know people have some variety of those with like Planeswalkers and shit. Yeah. And you know have a plan for artifacts because Painter will be around, and have a, a plan for I don't know the off the beaten path stuff. I'm I'm broad stroking it at this point yeah. after looking at all these results. I'm pretty happy that North America is the last Eternal Weekend. Yeah, it's uh, great for us. We we get, we get this, all all this information first. Um, Phil, uh, you know, if people listen to the podcast, the, uh, they get they get the benefit of knowing a couple things. One, I'm locked in. I know what I'm playing. What are you playing, Zach? I'm playing Infect. He's playing Infect. I'm what playing Infect. Playing? If you if you see this face across from you at about this angle. Prepare for infect. I look forward to getting poisoned in the uh, last round of the side event. <laughs> in the last round of the side <laughs> event that I play on Saturday before I yeah. jump back on a train at seven a.m. Uh, to get back uh, back to Philly. <laughs> yeah, on you, <laughs> you have a shorter time than I do. I'm going to be there early Thursday. I'm going to play in as many of the challenges as I can up until the main event to you know finish out get those the last reps couple in. of sideboard slots that I want. And uh, but yeah, I'm. Uh, well, guess what I'm on, Zach? Um, You'll never guess, dude. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that you're on White Weenie. White <laughs> Weenie, just for Mystic Sanctuary. White Weenie. Yep. That's uh, that's. Yeah, you, I mean, what else would I be doing? Obviously, you're on Miracles. Uh, but uh, Phil, before we get into a little bit more about uh, about Eternal Weekend and about the Asia results, I wanna I wanna talk about the. Uh, the like weekly MTG ban announcement that happened this week, and and some of the information that I kind of gleaned uh, through uh, you know the re- read between the lines, if you will, about uh, about what's going on with that. Uh, this is going to be, I think, a shorter episode because you know we've already we've already waxed intellectual about about uh, uh, Eternal Weekend anyhow. But uh, the ban announcement had some interesting uh, things. You know, we 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 found out they're for sure going to ban something in Modern. It's probably going to be Grief or Fury. Um, they're definitely going to ban something in Pioneer. Again, we, no one cares about this stuff that's listening to this podcast, and I don't even really care that much about about those two formats. 
But I think the interesting thing was when they started talking about Legacy and they said they weren't going to ban anything. But Phil, they didn't say they weren't going to unban anything, did they? Yeah, it's true. I think that they might. I mean, they did explicitly call out North American Eternal Weekend. Uh, yeah. And so I, I would be surprised if they wanted, given that they're going to be overhauling Modern and Pioneer to some extent, I'd be surprised if they also just tacked on some other unban in Legacy. Uh, we, we ta- I know you and I chatted before about like what they could even possibly unban, and you threw out Mana Drain, and I was like, great, unban Mana Drain, yeah. and nothing changes. Cool. It won't change anything. Uh, but I think I think that if if there's an opportunity to do to do something wacky and just see if if it sticks, like unban Mana Drain uh, here and uh, and and see what goes on. And I think they said you know nothing's going to get banned or unbanned in Vintage. They're not going to change Vintage at all. But they specifically didn't say. They just said like, no, we're not going to ban anything in, in Legacy and moved on. But they like kind of, it felt like a wink and a nod that like something might change. There might be a, a, an unban too. Um, and, you know, maybe that's crazy because there's a tournament coming up in a week. But I think if they do something like Mana Drain, it's not going to change anyone's metrics. Yeah, Mana Drain is not going to change anything. Unban Library of Alexandria, who cares? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the the bigger thing for that discussion that they had was, okay, yeah, we're going to ban something in modern. Obviously we have to overhaul something in pioneer because we just, you know, cracked another mechanic and that let's at least do another one card combo. But in legacy, they did talk about how the way that they will look at bands going forward for at least legacy, because it's, you know, it's much more of a community format at this point than, uh, uh, not a sponsored, uh, but a yeah. supported. Uh, As we speak, though, uh, to to point out, uh, we did just cap at nine fifty, like earlier yeah. this afternoon for the event. So the event is capped. North America Eternal Weekend is capped. Yeah. yeah. So, but they they were talking about how they were they base bans on you know f- what they they called funness, which isn't mm. a word, but uh, they were talking about how fun is a format and how fun are certain cards and play patterns. And that that would help inform them. And so a lot of that is going to be listening to the community at large, which means it was indicative to me when I heard it. I was like, okay, so it kind of means that like if you're loud enough, if the legacy community as a whole is loud enough, like they'll be like, okay, sure, whatever. Uh, Like we don't care. This is your format. Like if you guys don't want to play with this anymore, you don't have to. Yeah. Uh, But the thing is, is like they didn't like they were like, yeah, we care about the funness of the format, but then they didn't actually express explain even what funness is. But they didn't even take a shot on goal. (laughs) <laughs> like they didn't, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm cool with like, of course, like what else? It was exactly what I would imagine any of us would expect that they would talk about when it comes to like bans or unbans and legacy. You know, they acknowledge that like Mind's Desire didn't really move the needle in ways for combo, but like yeah. also because like combo sort of looks different now because combo is also Urza Saga. So it's like, okay, well, Urza Saga is really subsidizing like 50% of the format at this point. So it's like, what, is it combo because it also can beat down really easily as opposed to, you know, straight like Storm or whatever. But when they were talking about the funness of the format and what that actually means, they didn't explain it at all. And they also didn't have a good reply to somebody in their chat, just straight up asking, what does fun mean? How yeah. do you calibrate fun? What, what are the metrics that you would look at for fun? And the stuff that they looked at is they, they, they mentioned that they look at like tournament um, attendance uh, as a metric because if people are disengaging from a format, that's usually indicative of something. If you're like but, standard and no one's showing up to your LGS. Yeah, that, I think that that's like <laughs> that's what they were talking about pretty much, yeah. you know, for like when it comes to like the other formats. For Legacy, I imagine that like the the only historic ones that came to mind for me when they were talking about, you know, if the community is loud enough and they listen to the feedback from the community, everybody was really uh I mean, the one that comes to mind for me forever will be, you know, the the sign in the parking lot and the pizza sent to Watchy's office to get yeah. Sensei's Divining Top Band, like that sculpted the entire future of my Legacy uh <laughs> whatever. But uh but beyond that, like everybody was really vocal about Oko and they yeah. made, they took action on that. Everyone was really vocal on Dreadhorde Arcanist and they took a, a, a action on that. Underworld everybody was Breach. really vocal. Uh, under, Underworld Breach, but Underworld Breach was also just like very clearly objectively broken. Yeah. Uh, like Oko, you could argue, wasn't broken. It was just extremely unfun. Yeah. You know, I guess like, the other two cards you'd be talking about then would be Run in Six and Astrolabe. Astrolabe, arguably extremely unfun. And Ren and Six, same thing, uh, just like on rate, too good, particularly. But it's also like a, a lot of those bands are also from other things that are being su- that are subsidizing how how powerful they are. Yeah. Like Ren and Six in Modern, clearly not powerful enough to get get the axe. Ren and Six with Wasteland, clearly too good. Uh, Arkham's Astrolabe just makes it so that you can't play with the basic lands that you like, 
And so everybody was like, I want to just play with the basic lands that I enjoy. So get rid of this shit. And that's fine. Uh, Oko, you could argue maybe on power level isn't, isn't too legacy, isn't beyond legacy busted, but also just makes it so that games are just entirely like, what are we even doing here? Yeah. Uh, and then like, you could argue at this point, I feel like, like if Dread Articanus got on banned, like, is it better? Like, would you play it over Orcish Bowmasters at this point? Would you? Yeah. I didn't even like, like it I, when it was, when it was able to be played. I didn't think it was that good, but like, you know, people, people were up in arms about it. They didn't want you brainstorming two times. Yeah, I think it was I think was the also... lightning bolts were, were, were the actual problem. It was like getting a lightning bolt and then attacking and lightning bolt again. That's like a third of your life. Yeah, I, I I wonder if like the the difference between that versus like okay, if Orcas Bowmasters literally catches a single cantrip of any kind, it's just five damage to the dome for yeah. two mana, right? Like it deals one, it ETBs deals one, catches the draw, deals one, and then attacks for three. So like off of one catch for two mana, it deals five. Like and it can interact with your board in combat and blow out your creatures. Like is that worse than do you, than Dreadheart Arcanist in terms of like how that navigates play patterns? You can argue that it's like, all right, well, it makes you move into a third color for Blue Red Delver, but like, it still puts up the results. So like, does that mean anything? Blue Red Delver also losing expressive, but then still winning the European Legacy Championship, which we talked about, where it's like it's literally a trop splash for the three green pips off of the yeah. Question Druid, but otherwise it's just straight Blue Red it's Delver Blue Red anyway. Delver with the expressive iteration. Yeah, you know? so it's like I think like if you wanted to unban stuff out of off the list that they could take, they the stuff that they would unban isn't wouldn't help push anything that isn't already the best deck because yeah. all of the stuff that's banned for the most part was banned because of the Delver shell. Yeah. What are they going to like and unban so, treasure cruise? It's like, yeah, it's like unbanning anything else just like subsidizes the, 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 the Delver shell more. Yeah. Right. So it's like, okay. It, it's like DRC. You can't bring off none of the Delve spells you can bring off. Renin six is too busted. If DRC, if Dread Arcanist is like just going to be forgotten, even though it's probably fine at this point, it only is in the light in the Delver shell really. Uh, it's like you're not going to bring Astrolabe. Astrolabe, I think, is arguably the one that it's like actually like the unfun reason. Uh, nobody's going to be touching top anytime soon because it's literally just me and like the five other Miracles yeah. players in the world that like wanted to come off. Uh, and like that's it, right? Okay, Mana Drain can come off, sure. If they don't, but, like, if they don't unban Mana Drain. I'm making a shirt that says "Unban Mana Drain." The thing is, is I feel like we have we un, can put our un, energy unman we, Mana Drain. Unman Banner Drain. I think that like <laughs> that's not only the episode title, but I feel like we could put our efforts towards something so much better than <laughs> like you know. I, I actually think it would be pretty interesting to see what the world would look like if if there was a Dreadheart Arcanist unban. Like that's kind of interesting. Uh, I, I think that's like probably the closest one we're looking at. And it, but either way, I think that like what we learned from the announcement of the bands for Legacy is that they pretty much will just pay heed. To whatever we make the most noise about. Yeah. Uh, now, is that good or bad? I think it's good in that it means that the voice of the community matters in terms of the format and how we want to enjoy it. But I think it is less good in that it will only really reward the plurality that is the loudest for the cards that they don't like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I mean, we would cross that bridge when we get there. Like the, 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 the format is fine. Like it's yeah. been, the, it's like it through any lens of any other era, the format is exactly the same as it's always been since we started playing. Same it's as it ever was. Days, yeah. It's, it's, it's a it cheap threat wasteland days at the top of the format. And then you have some amount of like, you know, check pile control that in some, in the form of Euro plus cards, uh, you know, whatever the flavor du jour of the most recent busted card added to that mix is. And then you have some amount of dark ritual combo that you're going to run into and Urza Saga subsidizes half the format. Like that's what we're looking at. So it's like, have a plan for all that. And that's what the format is. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that uh, there's also something to be said that there, it's very rare that the community pushes to ax cards that punish the cantrip suite. So like in a way where Dreadhorde Arcanist was, uh, its power level was pushed because of the cantrip suite. Something like Orcus Bowmasters punishes the cantrip suite. So even though it's played alongside the cantrip suite and has the best results in the cantrip suite shells, it's not going to... I, I don't think it'll ever get the same heat because people have a a natural inclination to be really opposed to, like, ponder brainstorm because it does really well as opposed to, like, trying to help out the people who like to play Birds of Paradise. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. 
Well, so, you know, there we go. We've talked about the ban list. You know, we'll see if Mana Drain... We're going to post this at, like, 8 a.m. So, like, hopefully uh, you, you we find out very quickly if Mana Drain gets unbanned or not. Um, hey, Zach, Zach, if if we... If they unman Banna Drain, uh, are you gonna are you gonna sleeve up? Just uh, throw one control just deck? A misers a misers one Italian Mana Drain well, in my uh, in my uh, main deck. You have I will to have... I will. Yeah. Okay. Good. I will. We, 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 you you, you got to know you what I use it for. I'll activate my uh, Ink Moth Nexus several times. I guess. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, you have to if if you get to, if you if they unman Banna Drain, you have to play the full set in your seventy five for at least what the next two major tournaments. <laughs> I'll have to just find a, find a card that I can exploit with it too. That's the worst part. I'll like Bro, have to just... play like some to- you know, like six mana toxic creature or something like that. Like what Tyrannus Rex or something like that. In the, in Dude, the sideboard in the main. You are the eight cast bro. Just put your Karns back in your deck and do what we talked yeah, about. Dude, right? Full Karn. The Karnage. Full Karn. You can, um, you can, Mana drain your opponent's one drop and get that sweet, sweet one mana. So I think, uh, so going back to Eternal Weekend, the big, the big like differences in numbers are like land-based, uh, you know, in Asia, land-based fair, like Green Sun Zenith was at uh, 10%, 11%-ish. Uh, mid-range was at 12 and spell, uh, spell combo was at 15. Now, if we take those three numbers, so we got 10, 12, and 15, and we move them over to uh, 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 Prague, right? 14, 17, and 10. It's a wild, like, those numbers basically all add up to the, you know, very close to the same, the same like, total number of the meta, but very much, like, 5% in, in either direction. Yeah, I, I'm curious, uh, Zach, for the... For this kind of coverage... For these mm-hmm. kinds of like seeing these numbers, mm-hmm. what are you hoping we get to see and watch a lot of on coverage? I mean, I want to see. Uh, I want to see like first. I want to just see a Delvermere to just so people can see how miserable that is to like have to watch that. Um, just because <laughs> that, that is that is the future we live in. We deserve to be punished. Um, and after that, you know, I want to see decks that eat eat Delver because that's you know that's basically what it's going to be is like. The deck, the, the uh, my prediction out of this uh, uh, tournament is that decks that eat Delver end up winning, but Delver is still going to be largely the largest play, the like the largest played deck. So just just to get a quick idea, real fast, um, mm-hmm. Delver is what we got. Grixis Delver at five, uh, six percent in Prague, and Jeskai Delver at nothing, and uh, what we got Rug Delver. Uh, two percent. That's wild. No, I'm looking at win percentages. Aren't no, it's percentage of the meta. Um, so seven percent. That seems crazy. Uh, yeah, I you guess. Gotta, that's, you, you, impl- yeah, like, imagine how they how they have to do the splits. Like, yeah, uh, they'll take the total percentage of Delver Days Wasteland, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm just trying. Like, so we got Rug Delver is two percent, and Grixis Delver is six percent. And there's no, I didn't even see any is it Delver, right? Like I didn't see any blue red Delver. Um, there might be four color Delver. Four is four color Delver here. No, I don't see anything. So yeah, wild. Uh, so that's that's EU seven percent of the meta for Delver, and then the oh, rest of it's oh, scam, yeah, yeah. right? Because then that's scam what, that's is like another six yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah, you got to take it into account. We got uh, Joe Dyer's. Uh, Metrics here that for Asia it was 145 tempo decks that would be classified as tempo decks. 43 rug delver, yeah. Uh, 40 Grixis delver, so that's 83 delver decks in the field uh, as the yeah. two of the top three decks. Uh, and then Demir scam another 27 uh, copies. So uh, over 100 players playing. Well, this is Asia. Modes. I was just talking about yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Europe. So now Asia, oh, sure. you know. So now, so in Asia we're looking at Grixis delvers at six percent. It was at six percent. And the other one and Rug Delver at six percent. That's a marked increase in Rug Delver over over that one tournament because people saw it was good, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that that that's a thing. Just be ready for Delver. Be ready for Scam. I think. And you know, if your matchups are good against Delver and Scam, you're going to be pretty good against the rest of the format. I think. 
Yeah, I think the format is wide enough. The the I, I think more so as much as we talk about like have have plans for these things. I think it's good to have plans for the pillars, but also like the the event just sold out, right? And they're yeah. not going to add rounds, even though it's capped. So like to get to the top eight, you you're going to have to be like X one or better. Yeah, you got to like, win eleven rounds. Like you you really have to be un pretty much effectively unblemished in this yeah. tournament, and. That that means that not only are you going to have to like have good plans against those pillars, but you're also going to need like to you're going to need to get some amount of lucky throughout the course of the day. That's with any tournament. Yep. But then on top of that, you're also going to need to get really lucky in the pairings because I don't think there's any deck that just can straight up beat it, it, like there's no deck in the field that I think is favorable against everything else because yep. there are so many decks in the format, as particularly at the top tables as well, that can just cheese you. And if you, like. The, the the blanket of getting cheesed in the format to to take a loss in uh, across the day and then maybe you get paired against like an unfavored matchup once and then that costs you another like you're once you get two losses you're out you know yeah yeah go so get some it, food it's, it's it's just it's gonna be really <laughs> tight like so I, I don't know like for if you're going in and you're playing infect if you're one of the few infect players in in the event it's gonna be you maybe if Sam Dom shows up and then you know the followers thereof like you're going in against what decks that you hope that to never face as infect? I mean, I don't want like mono removal dot deck after that. Like, honestly, scam's very scam. I'm not really happy happy playing against because uh, if you just ruin my hand and then you snuff out my guy, like there's not a lot Days does against the snuff out. Bro, you are the Legolas's quick reflexes, yeah, my guy. Just... No, you're not. You're not wrong. It's just that free mana is is the problem. So being able yeah. to cast things, you know, because I'm I'm not gonna not cast Glistener Elf on turn one if I don't if I have it, you know, like so, you know, it's it's things like that. Uh, I think that Scam is probably one of the better decks set up to to stop uh, Infect. Um, you know, yeah. and that's if you're not patient. So if you're gonna be patient, you probably do all right. But you know, just just as a heads up, uh, what were there four Infect decks, three Infect decks in in Asia, and what we got? Uh, four. So seven Infect decks out of these thirteen hundred people. If you get paired up against Infect and you're prepared for it, God bless you. God bless you. You know, because it's it's so it's going to be pretty rare that you're going to play against somebody playing Infect. You know, like. Yeah, that's I, I don't that, know what to say. that's obviously that's obviously no. not one of the decks on the radar, but it no. is another day's deck, right? So like, yeah, if you if you have a chunky curve and are not prepared to like you know play low to the ground, then you're just gonna. I mean, that's that's all all things. Yeah. Uh, for what what are the other decks that like? What do you expect the top eight to look like at North America? I think I think you're gonna see a lot of. I think you're gonna see one or two of the, of those Oro control decks, right? Um, and I think you're going to see, uh, like, one combo deck that's either going to be, like, Painter. It's going to be something that's not on that list, right? But a combo deck that's not on that list, right? Um, maybe a Doomsday deck and, uh, you know, probably, like, three Delver decks. The Americans love their Delver, man. Like, I think that there's going to be a lot of Delver representation in this field. And if it's not three Delver decks, it's three Scam decks, you know? Yeah, do you think do you think there's going to be a higher percentage of scam at North America than there was at the other two Eternal Weekends? I definitely think there will be, and and I want to say this: uh, I think there will be a larger percentage of because of the number of people in this tournament. I think there will be a larger percentage of people who are like, "Well, I own the fetches, I own the shocks, I'll play Death Shadow, right? I own the griefs, I play Modern, right?" And I'll, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a Miser's Death Shadow in the top eight. Yeah, I, I know last episode we talked about uh, eight cast uh, doing really poor in Europe uh, and that like maybe you don't have to be prepared for it. I think the reason that it did so poorly uh, to amend that episode a bit uh, was people probably were just exceptionally prepared for it because it was the second most represented deck. Yeah, it it did not do very well at all, given that it was the second most represented deck, but it was the second most represented deck. And so I imagine that there will be some amount of uh, that like the the decks that don't require any reserve list cards, I imagine that those will also show up at a higher percentage for Eternal Weekend, given that it capped. Uh, 
And I think that that means that we will likely, as you said, there'll probably be a higher than normal representation of Death Shadow, probably a, an equivalent to what you would have actually expected of eight cast uh, generally, because the deck is still good. So it's yeah. like being prepared There's for that. There's a 3% drop off for Asia. Yeah, and I think it's that it, it's clear to me that the Asian numbers reflected off of the uh, Europe numbers, yeah, right? For like, sure, it was clear there was clearly influence there. Yeah, uh, I but mean, I after, that, like, just just the fact that like they were like, oh, okay, you know what's good against Rug Delver, Con- like Uro Control, I feel like is a, is a good choice against against Rug Delver, right? If you can stay in the game long enough, you just go over the top of that deck. Yeah, there's something to be said about uh, a high density of cards being able to go over the top of a wasteland. And so if a beanstalk can stick and convert a card, uh, it usually can be enough to overcome a single wasteland uh, if the game can develop to that point. Uh, It's how, I I mean, I've been a predict gamer for a long time, and the way that you would get through that first wasteland is if you could convert a predict and just go up some amount of raw resources, them spending time trying to stifle development when you have a way a, a, a lot more resources to get you through development you're able to you know power through this the first wasteland so i mean nothing's worse beans- than like opening uh, like you know old school rug delver playing playing that and like having like a hand that's like stifle waste waste or stifle stifle waste and then hitting a deck that just won't stop drawing lands mm-hmm. you're just like well i mean what was i even doing yeah you know, <laughs> it's that's usually how it goes. And also those decks have to respect because they're all Uro decks. They all usually have to respect Caracas, even though, you know, Caracas has sort of fallen of off a bit. But like they have to respect it. So there's always like the singular wasteland in the 60 plus in a life in the loam uh, because a life in the loam because their mana base sucks. Hey, I'm, I'm in that camp, right? Like I'm not playing Uro, but my mana base is trash. And so like I have to, you know, give the, 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 the hat tip to wasteland it being so prevalent. And so yeah. I have to play the loam. But I, I think that like also play draw really matters in that in that respect too you know wasteland timing really matters like if they have a threat and that wasteland converted for some amount of damage uh we talked a lot last time on i think it was two episodes ago three episodes ago where i went on a rant where i was like yeah delver is pretty much indistinguishable from infect at this point because merc tide is a one shot yeah and so like the, the same way that you have like your pump spells they just have bolts and like, if you just equate all those cards, they the games effectively play the same because nowadays it's less likely that three damage is like the lethal marker of like you're dead in a shot. It's like eight. It's like if you are at eight, that's the lethal marker because Mark Tide just kills in a shot. And so every hit that you take from a Delver or a DRC is like effectively when you just get chipped by uh, uh, an Infect and now you just have however much damage. And so it takes less pump spells to get across the finish line yeah that's like it, it's 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 pretty reminiscent in my mind of like how the deck actually plays out these days hey so, uh, phil i want to i want to hold that thought for one second because i wanted to bring up something you know it's it's christmas time season of giving uh the season of miracles as it were and um you know we i have a special uh announcement that i want to make uh we're we're uh helping out a a, a local friend uh who uh is doing this thing called Kimber's Cube. Uh, and it's for a child who has cancer. And we've got the link below for that. And, uh, you know, if you can, if you can uh, check that out and donate, you know, that's just, uh, it's, it's a feel good for the, for the, for the holiday season. I think, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, helping out the, lo- helping out the local community and, and it's for a good cause. So I think that's something that we should, I, I just want to highlight, um, you know, in the middle of this discussion about Eternal Weekend, I think that's a great spot to put it because we have your full attention and if you have the means to help this kid out, uh, there you go. Yeah, and I will I will start helping out by uh, stop talking about Merc Tide. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, so uh, I've got that I've got that link to uh, below. Just check that out, and uh, you know, like I said, if you have the means to help help support uh, this this kid's situation, uh, good on you. Yeah, if there was if there was a time to like you know put any uh, expendable funds anywhere. This is the that's the spot to do it. It's a it's a pretty good. Uh, obviously, it's the time of year for it, and also like if you get to go through and like read about it, it is it's it's magic related. It's called Kimber's Cube. It's very much worthwhile. So if you can, that's the place to to go. Uh, you know, we always appreciate the support on our cast. If you have the means to support us this time around, throw it over there. Yeah, please. Um, so going back o- over uh, the some other some other interesting points about Asia uh, versus versus EU is uh almost the exact same amount of stompy 
uh, is being played. So Stompy Stompy's metric didn't change at all. Um, the graveyard uh, did did change for Asia. We got a we got a small lift in the graveyard for Asia, and uh, the the non blue for Asia went up almost double. I mean it's it you know nine decks out of six hundred or whatever. But that that almost doubled, and I think those metrics are worth are worth talking about, and, and you know at, at least worth noting. You know, yeah, go for it. So if if we're seeing an increase in in graveyard, and and you know we can extrapolate that from the previous, uh, the, you know we can look at Europe and say, oh, people were like not respecting the graveyard, uh, according to the Asian uh, results, right? Um, and and you know. The, I don't know. What do you think? Asia's let's check out what their win percentage was for for uh Reanimator cuz Reanimator is going to be the telling telling result here. Um Reanimator had a yeah, 45% win percentage. So it was not it wasn't great, but it wasn't bad versus uh, sorry, that was e uh e uh EU for 45%. And Asia had there we go. Uh about the same. So that increase in, in in graveyard strategy didn't change anything. So uh, what have we learned? The graveyard's still dead? Eternal Dirtles is proud to be sponsored by Moxfield. Moxfield is the best Magic the Gathering deck building website on the internet. You can create, share, and find decks from Commander to Legacy and even fan-supported formats like Pre-Modern and Old School. You can see all of our decks on our Moxfield. Follow the links below to stay tuned. Yeah, I think that the the thing to keep in mind about the reanimator strategies is, yes, for a forty five percent win percentage across two both EWs does not bode well for its chances in North America. No, and I think that I think that reanimator will have a similar result in North America. I think it will at best do around forty five percent. I don't think it's a deck to play if you're looking to win the event because. Like we were talking about before, you can't have a blemish on your record if you're going to top eight. Like, you can maybe give a match if you have good breakers, but that's it. So going into, uh, you know, playing that kind of combo deck where you are sort of at the mercy of how prepared your opponents are for you isn't a great spot to be, given that you don't really have space to maneuver. Yeah. Now, that is to, not to say, though, that you should be unprepared or that people will move away from Reanimator. I still think it's going to be a highly represented deck. It's always a represented combo deck. It's like... Uh, not a difficult deck to pilot. It's something that's fairly easy to pick up that has like crossover from other formats. If you, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's something that's fairly linear. And so like, if you don't have a lot of time to like practice for an event, it's like, okay, I'm just going to play reanimator. I know like this deck plays this hate, this deck plays this hate. I can keep that like notes on the side and just look at like, oh, my opponent's on initiative. This is the hate that they bring in post board. Exactly. I bring in these stuff. And it's like really simple in that regard. Like, and by, I mean more simple than like the other types of decks that are trying to like pivot and maneuver how to like navigate something. Like you care about like very, very, very specific things. And so it's, it, you know, brings the amount of decisions that you have to in a much more narrow lane. And that's, you know, useful for the people that haven't had time to, you know, put in a lot of testing and, and still just want to jam games. So I expect it to show up in, uh, in a decent number and, uh, you know, I, I personally would not skimp on the graveyard hate because I think that like, if you're going to go unblemished, I, you know, I know that there's always like the thing of like, how much are you, you know, hate, are you really supposed to dedicate to, to fast combo and graveyard combo and et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's one of those things where your graveyard hate for the decks with games that go long. So like the stuff that you're boarding in against like Delver or four color or, you know, any of the decks where the games develop, your your sideboard cards are less likely to have like the the game ending swingy impact that the sideboard cards for the games that go you know three turns max will. You know what I mean? So like it, the 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 time frame in which you have to uh, leverage your sideboard cards against decks like Delver or Four Color or any of the other like mid rangey esque like you know, Obzon decks or whatever, like all those kinds of cards, you'll have more time to leverage them. Where against combo, if you don't find your shit early and you just lose the combo, even though you're, you're like, oh, I should have boarded more and then I wouldn't have had this blemish on my record and now I can't, you know, top 16 or whatever. Like that's, just keep that in mind, right? Like I'm not saying, you know, overhaul your sideboard and, you know, max out for combo. Yeah. But like, I, I think your your sideboard should probably lean still a little heavier towards combo because 
you you just need a higher density of that stuff because the games are shorter. Yeah. And you can't afford to take those losses in an event this big. Yep. Uh, other interesting things like the non-blue, I assume that's just Maverick because like every every other archetype is sort of based. So there's land-based but fair green sun zenith, right? That's 10%. But then there's non-blue. And I don't know what those decks even are at that point. What is a non-blue look- but non-green sun zenith deck? Like elves? Well, Elves is Green Sun Zenith. I mean, I, I think yeah. you could look at, like, I mean, all of the non-blue stuff that I think about are Green Sun Zenith. It's like uh, Depths and Abzan yeah. uh, Cradle uh, dot decks or whatever. The, the, uh, did 18 non- Mardu decks uh, enter this tournament? Is that what happened? I mean, I think <laughs> that, like, you know, R- R- Red Stompy probably being cashed in close alongside Boros Initiative yeah. is... Are we considering, I mean, I think, like, death and taxes, like, non-blue? DNT, DNT is in, would, would be in that category for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, any other, like, if there are any other artifact-based Vi- strategies. Isn't that I mean, vile? Isn't that a vile deck? Yeah, yeah I just don't I, know. I, it, I just don't know. You just don't know. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's why it's in the other category. But the decks, the decks based on Asia, the decks you should be prepared, uh, prepared against, I think your sideboard should have answers for uh, Delver and Scam. Uh, know know how to play around Stompy. Like, don't get Blood Mooned out of the out of the tournament, right? Uh, ha- have something for combo. Uh, and and then after that, it's kind of like you know, in, just be able to win your fair matches. Like everything else, it's like land based decks. You know, if if you lose to a dark depth, you lose to a dark depth. So I, I don't think that sideboarding specifically against dark depths is going to really help you. Uh, you know, graveyard is often gonna cross over with with combo, so I think you're good there. Uh, after that, like you know, permanent combo. I guess like if you have something that you know uh, that is gonna stop uh, painter, but I don't know. I think I think focus on Delver, focus on Scam, and focus on uh, focus on Stompy. Be be aware and ready to to not lose to Stompy. Yeah, I don't even know what you do to beat Boros Initiative, though. Like, I don't know what cards you're like, oh, I can bring this in that's good against Initiative. I think just be Infect, dude. Just be Infect. Just play Infect. I I think that one thing to note, too, (laughs) I I think there is something to be said about if you're going into an event like this and, you know, we, we talk about the things to be prepared for and what to be prepared for and looking at these numbers and what decks are likely to show up. The thing is that the event is so large, right? Like, 950 players getting a calibration on like what you're likely to run into. Like, let's say Delver is the most, like some variety of Delver is still the most played deck, right? Yeah. Let's say it shows up and it's 15% of the field, right? Some variation of Delver. And you're like, okay, I'm going in, I'm going to play against Delver. Make it a thousand players. So the math is easy. If you're going in and it's like, okay, 150 players out of a thousand are on Delver. Then you're, you're very unlikely to run in against Delver. You know what I mean? <laughs> so Round one, you it, have it, a 15% chance, right? <laughs> yeah. So in, in that regard, I, I think that there is something to be said about like the, the because the, 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 the tournament is so large and we know that going in, that there is something to be said about the deck that you're playing that you have to just, I mean, th- at least this is the way that I'm approaching. And I, I, I think based on my discussions with people that I've talked to that it's, it's a smart way, at least I, at least I can't think of a, a, a more intelligent way to approach this kind of tournament. Uh, if you have reps with a given deck is that you have to assume going in that your, your pairings lottery is going to favor you. Like just I mean, assume that you're going to yeah. hit the pair. Like if, <laughs> what are you, if even doing? you, you have, <laughs> if you go in assuming that you're going to hit the pairings lottery, like all the way through the entire event, which is what everybody's going to need to do. Everybody who top eights to some degree will have done that. Right. Yeah. Uh, or if they ran into a, 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 a architect that they were hoping not to, they got really lucky because their opponent like mulled a five into oblivion and just didn't play. Yeah. Right? 12 and rounds. Like, I don't think someone's going to say, Oh, I lost the die roll most of my rounds and got bad matchups the entire time and still got there. Like, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of luck on on the side of the people winning this thing. So the the point that I was trying to make is that if you go in assuming that the matchup lottery is going to favor you regardless, right? Mm-hmm. Just as a blind spot going in, you're like, this is how the world and the timeline that I live in is going to happen. I will just get my matchup lottery and it's going to be great. In that regard, I would then whatever you think you can't beat, like whatever matchup you think you're just cold against. It's like a 9-10 matchup. And Ignore you're like, I'm not, just, 
just ignore it. Yeah, Save just those spots it. and put it put it towards something else that actually like would be meaningful. Like those sideboard slots would be meaningful against. You know what I mean? So like I'll, I'll just use mine as an example because it's the way I've been thinking about it. So it's a good uh, at least it's at least analogous for people listening. I'm on effectively creatureless miracles, right? I am going my, my win percentage against Boros Initiative will be zero games out of 100 games, right? I'm never beating that matchup. And even if I dedicated my entire sideboard to trying to solve that matchup, it's unlikely that even then I would solve it. Yeah. And so rather than commit like a Torpor Orb or like some, you know, creature transformation sideboard, whatever, to try and, you know, fight over the thing, like they are just going to beat me on an axis that my deck or the archetype that I'm choosing to play just does not fight on. In which case, I should just assume that if I get paired against it, ah, shucks, right? I lost that matchup lottery. That's unfortunate. So be it. Fight it but out. Like, yeah. But, there, but there, is, there is no archetype that will be a large enough percentage of the field that you are likely to run into it because yeah. the format is so large. So unless Delver shows up and is literally 40% of the field, in which case over a nine round tournament, that math adds up that you're like, okay, yes, I'm going to face it a couple of times. Like, Unless we get to that point, which who knows, maybe people are just going to show up with what you talked about. Like maybe yeah. it's just going to be a bunch of like budget DNT players and like that'll be like super popular. And we just don't realize it. Like in that regard, I would ignore the stuff that you just know you can't beat yeah. because that will save you the stuff where like against the other pillars of the format. Like if you're soft to Urza Saga and you're like, but if I just devoted a couple more cards to beating Urza Saga, then I probably have a better favor, I'm a little bit more favorable against it. Like do that instead. I think yeah. that's just that that's more conducive to getting the, the results that you would like to get than trying to solve matchups that are unwinnable. And I want to take a look at it at the Asia Legacy Championship. So EW Asia. Mm -hmm. The one player that went undefeated in the Swiss was the Oops All Spells player, right? Now, the Oops All Spells player did make a bunch of adjustments in their sideboard, right? Or not in their sideboard, in their main deck. They were playing the full set of Leyline of Sanctity uh, on top of Leyline of uh, making everything instant speed, right? Leyline of Anticipation. Of Anticipation. They were playing six Leylines in their main, right? Okay, cool, whatever, you're innovating on the turn one combo deck, like, who cares? Now, the thing that I want to talk about with, with those innovations, though, right, is that the matchup lottery, through the majority of their entire event, was so favorable for exactly the changes that they made yeah. that, like, you can't, you can't draw up a matchup lottery better than what this player ran into. Let's talk about it for a sec, okay? Go for it. Round one, if you're on Oops All Spells, right, put yourself in the Oops All Spells with four Lena, Leyline of Sanctity in your main deck. Uh, player that's who you are for lay Lennon of sanctity i'm playing oops all spells let me your scam you, your first round <laughs> you go up against you go up against 12 posts in your opening round oh hell yeah on. that's a that, yeah that's, that's a buy, buy. <laughs> round two round two i'm on the four ley line of sanctity dot deck and i play against reanimator oh that's sweet that's lovely round three i play against sneak and show we're both combo decks and i'm way faster way faster right and they're, they're not putting me up under nearly enough pressure. And in order to win, they need three cards, right? Your, yeah. your entire deck is built on going off turn one. And you can beat a single force of will. Like, the deck can beat a single force. Okay, great. Round four, reanimator again. Oh, how lovely it is to be the four Leyline of Sanctity deck against all these thought seizes. Yep. Round five, you're going up against eight cast. Again, they are uh, uh, a bunch too of slow. force of wills. You're too slow. A bunch of force of wills. And if you win the die roll, you can just blitz check them constantly, yeah. right? And you can beat the forces. And, like... You're playing Leyline of Anticipation as well, so it's like maybe there's the, the angle where like when you bring in the force of uh, negations post board, like even that's not good enough. Whatever. Round six, guess. Round six. Uh Demir Scam. Reanimator again. <laughs> oh my god. Right? We're we're through round six, and you have yet to play against Days. And and this is right? another undefeated reanimator player in round six. Pretty wild, actually. Round seven. Remember, your Leyline of Sanctity. What did you play against in round seven? Reanimator. Ad nauseum tendrils. <laughs> oh, no! Oh. Like, like, but you, you, see, you see what I mean so, so far, <laughs> yeah, right? No, like, it's ridiculous. This, 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 this player is playing oops with four Leyline of Sanctity and then went up in the first seven rounds, one, two, three, yeah, wow. four Thoughtseize decks without any other form of interaction. How good do you feel at, at like, it, going into round eight where you're just like, I... Pick the best deck for every matchup I've gotten. The only decks that had interaction that didn't care about Leyline of Sanctity were literally Sneak and Show and Eight Cast, and both of them don't attack Too your slow. mana. Too they slow. don't attack. They they the only instance that they interact with you really is 
Force of Will. And the deck yeah. is designed to beat a Force of Will. Okay, round eight, finally, they play against Is It Delver. Okay. And, th- like, the the one, the, the, this round, they still won it 2-1. That is indicative to me. I assume that means that they won the die roll. But, yeah, they they played against probably the matchup they didn't want to play against, but they got it, right? Yeah. Cool. The, the, you don't always, it's tough to win game ones uh, if you're only on Force of Will and not much else. But, like, they got through the, t- I would think that that's the tough matchup. Okay. Yeah. Round nine. What do you think they played against? Reanimator. Doomsday. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's the no other, good. another Thoughtseize deck. Yeah. Right? They played against like, all the, of again, this Thoughtseize. That's a deck that's a combo deck, but it's too slow. Round 10, their last round, what'd they play against? Uh, Death and Taxes. Scam. Scam. I can't. Demir, Demir, <laughs> Demir Scam. Yeah. Demir scam. So, so this this player went undefeated, and the only time that they ran into a matchup that you would argue maybe they didn't want to run into was exactly in round eight against Is It Delver? Yeah. And they're the deck that is so leveraged that if they won the die roll, then maybe it doesn't matter anyway. But like otherwise, they like I'm the Oops All Spells. I'm gonna play four Leyline of Sanctity, and I'm gonna play against one, two, three, four, five, six of my ten rounds against explicitly Thoughtseize. Like, yeah. are you kidding? That's that it's that's good. what I mean by like. You like if you are going to assume that you're going to win the matchup lottery, like that's the way to do it, yeah. right? And then they just ran the table, and then they knock, knocked out in the quarterfinal because they played against four color control. Like yeah. that's it. That's all. That's all it took. So I, I think like if we are all in the mindset of the leyline of sanctity, only going to run into thoughtsies all day player, that's the way that we top eight this event. Yeah, I I know I agree, um, Phil. I think that is a wonderful place to leave it. That's great advice. And I just want to leave everybody with this uh, this final thought from uh, is a from American folk singer songwriter Thomas Petty. You can check those out into They're the great wide open, and uh, you're going to learn a lot, and you're going to meet a lot of the great people Amen. that help this community grow. All right, thanks so much for watching. Have a thanks great everybody one. for Bye. watching, and we will check you out next week when we have uh, our results later on. Have a good one.